welcome back. I, I still gave a title to that talk, even though, um, as, as you noticed, I couldn't keep the promises of the title yesterday, but uh, I'll still continue here in practice. Okay, so, so let's, let's recall what have we seen so far. So if, if F x to B is a Lagrangian vibration, of um, the phi h s m of x, then we've seen that the fibers, the general fibers, are medium varieties. We've seen that general singular fibers Um, have some relation to Kodaira singular fibers. Of elliptic surfaces, and the base is a funnel uh, of the car red one. So that is the best that we could get as a generalization of the case of K-free surfaces, where the general fiber was an elliptic curve, the uh, singular fibers were good I mean, singular fibers, and the base was P1. So then I wanted delta. The discriminant, so that's T and D, such that the fiber XT is singular inside of B. And I think I mentioned or proved one part and uh, I mentioned the other part. Result of one of these of telling us something about this um, this delta. So in the above situation, we have that uh, delta is non-empty. That's what, what I proved by some topological argument. <laughs> we use the simply connectedness of the base, or to be more precise, of the regular locus of the base if the base is potentially singular. Um, and then the other result is that if you look at this discriminant, so that's called the discriminant, if I look at how it looks like in the regular part of B, <coughs> this is a divisor. Co-dimension one, and um, the, the way they show it is they say, uh, okay, suppose there is some like, isolated co-dimension two part of the discriminant. <coughs> then what they do is they they take the local system um, of, of first cohomologies in the neighborhood of that uh, thing, and because you remove something of co-dimension two. Uh, you can extend the local system. And then in extending the local system, they can extend the abelian vibration. So that's the way how they show that, that this cannot have isolated co dimension um, two or smaller, I mean, bigger co dimension components. All right. And I, so yesterday I was a bit vague about what general singular fibers are. And by general, if you have a singularity that has three or more fundamental group, does this argument uh, go through the whole thing? I don't have mono. If I have three or fundamental group, I cannot have more than mono. Yes, um, for some reason I thought that. So I think the answer is yes, but. 
I thought there was no, there was a, an argument for there not being uh, a singularity with trivial local fundamental Okay. I mean, your theory double point in dimension three has to be. I think I think I think the argument goes through there. Because it's essentially well um let's see. But I think it's it's true. Um so general singular fiber uh that that meant general well, generic in um The closure of this one uh, intersected with the regular part. So, so you disregard stuff that is isolated in the singular part. So that's what general singular part is. Well, I mean, here's a here's a question. So, um, so this was again by one in the viso. Does one for ESO classification of singular fibers, of general singular fibers, hold for all on say XT? Where T is in maybe let me let me give a let me give a name for that. Um, so let me call that delta one. So one is the codimension of all T in delta one red. So in all examples, I know this is the case. Let, let me maybe um, comment on what this means. This means, well, okay, so you have a classification of general singular fibers, which is, which are not too bad. So the question is, what does general really mean? Uh, I said general inside of here, but is general just a smooth point? So in other words, if the fiber degenerates more, um, does this also force the, uh, the discriminant to degenerate? I don't know any other examples. I would be very interested if you have examples of, of vibrations where this is not the case. I don't know. Maybe giving giving uh, counter examples or giving negative um, answer to, the, to that question may be easier to prove than, than proving it. But you can prove it. It's it's even better. Okay. Um, so much about singular fibers. Oh, no, sorry. There is one more thing I wanted to wanted to say. So here is um, the next question: Is how about <coughs> the singular locus of B? How does it behave with respect to delta? So. That's question one. It's very imprecise. So question two is maybe the same is contained in delta. So in other words, if you have a singular point in the base, look at the fiber over it. Is that is that fiber automatically singular? One would. Think that this is the case. Um, maybe I even have an argument, but uh, I mean it's from yesterday night, so I don't care. <laughs> um, well, is it a torus? Is it a Lagrangian torus? 
what does it mean to uh, that the morphism is smooth? That's a good point. No, no. If the morphism is smooth, yeah, that's 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 a very good point. If the morphism is smooth, then um, uh, so the fiber is not it's not singular. Uh, the, the, the point that the base is not singular. But I just want the fiber to be smooth. What, a, a smooth morphism is a flat morphism uh, with smooth fibers. So and flatness is the, is the issue. So suppose the answer to, to question two is positive, then we can ask even, even more. So is the sing contained in delta one? It is um, co-dimension one part of um, this criminal. And now let me just draw some pictures. So, um, Discriminant in red. <coughs> and so here are three possible situations. You could have, um, let's see, you could have the discriminant. And can you raise the board? Uh, Sure. I don't know what a couple of inches is. <laughs> 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 uh, okay, so you can have a singularity here. So x is b sing and, and delta here. You could have um, this one. So sing the, the singular local being part of the discriminant. Or in the best of all worlds, it, it would look like this. So this would be um, let me see. Um, okay. <clears throat> this would be a positive answer to question three. This would be a positive answer to uh, what? To question two, but not to question three. And this would. What would be um, yeah, a negative answer to all the questions. And I should say that um, so I tried to, to prove this here in a more general context, namely with variety X is allowed to be singular. But then Mirko uh, gave an example. Of, um, so x singular uh, irreducible holomorphic symplectic. Um, I shouldn't say manifold, but variety such that. So what was your example? Your example. So question three. The answer to question three was no. Uh, but the answer to question two was still yes. So question three, no. Question two, yes. So in other words, oops. Sorry. So Mirko's example was um, was uh, such an example here. Yeah. Right. Okay, um, but as I said, this, this wasn't the case where x is allowed to be singular, the case where x is smooth. Well, I, I come to what the singular look of the p might look like um, now. It's not counting, so what can we say about the base? So here, here is a conjecture. F from X to B, a Lagrangian integration of an IHS MX. So back in the smooth case. And then B is projected in space. So in particular, Uh, 
he is he is from singular. So you might ask, what's the what's the point of these questions here? Well, um, we're not there yet. It's conjecture, and I well, I, I know that some people do do not believe in that conjecture, and uh, and in any case, maybe it would uh, you know something something. Um, I mean, a step on the way to proving that conjecture. Or you come up with nice counterexamples. But I think it's it's good to think about these questions, even though we have a conjecture. Okay, so um, that would be a perfect generalization of the K3 surface case where the base was P1. Um, yeah, and well, I think final, big term number one, and log terminal singularities. Um, maybe some evidence, but it's still far away from being PN. So. Um, that's the context. All right. Uh, maybe I should say uh, what do we know about this conjecture? Uh, uh, what is the uh, example? Why the example provide uh, answer to question two? Uh, maybe this example? Yeah. Uh, it's a you take a, a smooth a generalized coma vibration over P2, uh -huh. and then you take the quantum by, uh, by uh, the group is two elements um, of the whole vibration. <laughs> the variant action is the quotient. The base in that case is uh, weighted projective space P112. <laughs> And so in that case, it's very, um, the base is smooth. So like in the example, the base is very uh, No, it's it's singular. It's yeah. weighted projective space, not. Yeah, but that deal with contrary to Sorry, I was confused about. You see that in general for that gun vibration, the the base is conjecture at least to be smooth. Yeah. Um. The the um. And it's hidden in the M here. So, uh -huh. so V stands for variety, which which is singular, possibly, but, but M stands for manifold. Oh, I see, I see. I see. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. It's not a counterexample to the conjecture. Uh -huh. how, does, yeah. how does this conjecture compare to the conjecture simply that the singular locus is M? Sorry? How does, if, if, I, if you made the conjecture the singular locus is empty, could you then prove as a consequence that the yeah. yeah. Oh, maybe you're going to come over. So, <laughs> good question. So, um, yeah, known uh, cases. So, maybe let's go a trivial one before. So, if, um, if uh, f from x to b has a section. Once you have a section here, then and B is smooth by intersection here. Right? What, what's having a section? So having a section means you have something like that, right? And a section is something that um, Intersects fibers uh, with multiplicity one. So if you have a singularity here, I mean, whatever intersection it takes, it couldn't be transversal. Uh, and then um, that, that should uh, um, give that B is smooth. So this is one case. Um, maybe it's more of a remark than uh, a known case is that. Um, so as well, B smooth is equivalent to to um, F being flat by um, by the fact that we have equidimensionality of Matsushita's theorem. So if you have uh, a flat morphism. From a smooth variety, I mean, so flat in general, 
um, smoothness descends along flat morphism. So if there's a smooth thing, flat morphism for something, then in the base you will get this smooth as well. And if D is smooth and the morphism is equidimensional, uh, and there is um, a result called empirical flatness um, that, that tells you that uh, under a very mild hypothesis of the singularities of X, I think Cone Macaulay is sufficient to smooth the morphism is flat. So, um, equidimensionality and flatness are, are the same if the basis, if the target is smooth and the domain is called Macaulay. Okay, and why are these actually known cases? Because um, so the base is this is the end. Yeah, that is the end. So there is one theorem showing that if X is projective and D is smooth, then D is the end. Okay. So There is some addendum to that by Daniel Grip and myself. So we remove um, the hypothesis that X is projective. So means um, if you have X just an IHSM, potentially killer, as soon as B is smooth, then, then B is. Uh, yeah. I mean, I should say the a large part of the work is, is really one's um, theorem, and the, the reduction of the killer case to the projective case is not that difficult. Okay, so you can either show directly that the base is PN, or you can just show that the base is smooth and then apply one's result. Uh, and I should also mention that there are new proofs of. So, first of all, there is Lee and Tosati. And so that, that was on the archive a couple of days ago, I think, actually. And then there is a new proof of Baker Schnell, which is not yet on the archive, but um, they already uh, give talks about it. And so this uses um, Keller-Einstein techniques and, and curvature estimates. And this result here uses a theory of, of Hodge modules. And it, it, it could be that actually both, both proofs are um, essentially the same because the model, in, in the theory of Hodge modules, the, 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 there are some curvature um, estimates hidden there. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to um, both of them being available. This proof here, I mean, when I when I last uh, saw it, was very very short, five or six uh, pages. You know, proofs can can grow uh, over time. But it's potentially, a very short. Proof. Uh, right. Um, so what else? There is. The result by five banks <coughs> and Kenyon uh, 2 saying that um, if I don't know, maybe they need X, is, uh, X to be projective, but the dog, but the essential, I think that can be the essential hypothesis is that the dimension of X is four, so the dimension of, of B is. Um, is two, then B is P2. So in particular, they prove the, the smoothness. And this is um, still on work of Ren Hao Wu. So I think it's, um, so it's a bit different. So in, in general, uh, which we see in the proof of one and also in the Lee uh, Society and Baker Schnell proofs is uh, you need to talk about uh, rational curves. So there are characterizations of, of Pn in terms of rational curves. Uh, 
Um, so one who uses uh, his variety of minimal rational tangents, and I think uh, the others use this characterization. So if you have um, If you have x, uh, which is smooth, then x is pn if and only if uh, for all curves, I mean, oh, okay, bad choice of, sorry, bad choice of, um, of names. So this is independent of Lagrangian vibrations. That's just a result about characterizing projective space. If you have a smooth uh, projective algebraic variety, then that's Pn if and only if for all curves C in uh, in X, you have that minus Ax times C, the intersection number is greater or equal to n plus one. In B, right? Sorry? Didn't yeah, sorry. Okay. Still in change. Okay. Um, and so, so some of by Matsushita's theorem, we know that there are many rational curves because the you know, final final varieties are rationally connected and join these two points by this chain of rational curves. Um, so. And then you have to do something with these rational curves. So essentially, what you're, I mean, you're trying to identify rational curves of minimal degree, and these rational curves of minimal degree should be the, the lines in, in projective space. Um, so you always have to talk about rational curves, and that's also why this hypothesis of P being smooth is so essential. So if you want to talk about deformations of rational curves, you're pretty much lost if um, the ambient variety is uh, singular. But it's happily different. Did it seem to be final or something? Uh, I, I think it's um, I think it's a, probably a consequence, right? Uh -huh. um, because if minus K B intersects um, okay. all curves uh -huh. uh, away from I mean really with a gap, um, then they may probably apply uh primus criteria. Yeah, I said yeah. because there's the whole angle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So here are more questions. So what about more geometric hypotheses? So of course, yeah, feel free to, to prove the conjecture in the general case, but um, if you, you want to add, it might make sense to add some hypotheses and then try to see. So uh, let's suppose f from x to b as a rational section. I mean, then, then you have, so why I think this is a good um, hypothesis is that, um, as I said, it's, it's about deformations of rational curves. And now if you have a, a rational section, then you know that there are many rational curves in X. So you have a family of rational curves in X whose images cover, cover B. 
and X is smooth, and in X you can deform references more easily. Uh, the problem here, when I, um, I mean, I didn't try that very, very long, but uh, so what you have to uh, have to take care of is suppose you have your section, you, you take the image of that section inside X, you have a rational curve inside of that. Um, it's not clear to me that this, so if you deform that rational curve, it might be able to, to go out of that uh, section. So I think if it remains within the section, then that's, uh, that's probably good, and then you have a good chance to prove that. Um, the base is smooth, but if it moves out, um, I don't know. Then, so this is something that one has to think about. Uh, also, I mean, there, there are various strategies. You could try to use these, these characterizations to prove that the base is PN right away. You could also try to use some birational geometry to take that rational section and make it an actual section. Um, of course, then you're not allowed to lose the, the vibration. Or um, maybe you can use some deformation theoretic techniques to get that rational section to, to become a, an actual section. Um, these are just some ideas. It would be great if someone came up with a solution. Or another assumption would be uh, if you have unirule divisors uh, dominating the base B. Well, if, I don't know whether that's a good assumption, but it's another assumption that gives you many rational curves upstairs. So some <laughs> assumption of that, of that sort might be interesting. Also, I would be very interested in uh, a lattice theoretic um, Lattice theoretic assumptions. So for example, there is this recent paper by the Bar, the Marti, and Wozon. They have a different purpose. Um, they, they want to, to classify a certain class of hypercular uh, fourfolds. But so one of the uh, achievement of that paper is they figure out which which are the um, lattice theoretic hypothesis to put, and uh, so maybe if if you're able to <coughs> formulate in, in terms of lattice theory what it means to have a section or or you know some other properties of the Lagrangian vibration, I think that would also be uh, an important uh, contribution. Have fun uh, trying to add some assumptions and trying to, to prove it. All right. Uh, so we, I mean, I discussed the K3 example, and now I'm trying to to uh, check all uh, the interesting things that we had in the K3 case. So we discussed the fibers, we discussed uh, the base. This was. Um, yeah, okay, so in, in the K3 case, that's not so not so difficult. But here, um, that is, a, I think, a very important conjecture. Because, for example, this, this paper by, um, by these four authors, what they do is they, they classify a certain class of, of hyperkiller variety, mm -hmm. and they actually use uh, that in their case the conjecture is known. So if you could add some more known cases, uh, I think that would, would have a lot of applications. Right, um, next topic would be existence. In the K3 case, this was pretty simple. We just had an isotropic net class, and uh, then by Riemann Rock, you could show that it actually gives rise to a Lagrangian vibration. Here, it's again a conjecture. Conjecture says that if um, X is an IH SM, and if you have L line bundle on X, which is not the trivial line bundle, uh, 
uh, and has the property that Q of C1 of L is zero, which is the case for, for the pullback of an ample bundle from the base of a Lagrangian vibration, then if I look at the linear system of some multiple of L, Then there it is N. I have to take a large enough such that the morphism of the social the linear system is a Lagrangian vibration. So that's some, sometimes that's called the, uh, the SYZ conjecture. Uh, although uh, Stromming and Yaw Zastop were not the, the ones who formulated in the, in the uh, holomorphic symplectic setup. Um, oh, 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 I, this is the hypothesis I need. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, let me discuss that now. I, I need that uh, this is a nef line bundle on X. I could formulate it uh, somewhat less, somewhat more general. So if I don't ask nefness, then I should get a rational language integration. <laughs> Now that I erase things, I, I notice that there is one uh, case uh, that I, I omitted. Uh, so it's known that the base is, is PN. I think all known examples of irreducible uh, So this, this is the last conjecture and the one that's in that board before. Um, there is some evidence for that coming from basically everything that we that we know. Um, so remarks and known cases of the SYZ. So also all known examples of IHSM. And I think here probably I should attribute this to Dr. Brian McCree, or I think in generalized Kummer and Hilbert scheme type. And I don't, honestly, I don't remember um, who, who did the O'Grady cases, but uh, known in all cases. All right. Um, well, that's, one two cents. Um, yeah. So essentially, um, higher dimensions are um, are open. Uh, I wanted to make one more remark. Oh yeah, of course. So there is the. Yeah. Above mentioned paper by the Baron Wolfgang Smartly and Bozin um, does four folds, so hypercalar four folds, IHSM four folds uh, with, with strong assumptions. Um, 
on the letters. I mean, this is one of the best results that we have, but, um, but still, I think the assumptions on the, on the letters are very strong, and that's still very far away from the, from the general case. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's not new, but it's it's under okay. different assumptions. Yeah. But maybe those assumptions don't apply to the Yeah, I, I was going to pose that as, as, an, as a question um, in, in a second. So I think that's all. Oh, well, no, maybe, sorry, that's certainly people have, have worked on similar cases, but let me say there are. Uh, no general results. As far as I know, there are no um, general results that can give you the um, existence of, of this thing here. So, um, oh yeah, sorry. One thing I, I forgot to mention is that this conjecture is, of course, a special case of a conjecture that we have in in higher dimensional rational geometry. Which is the semi ampleness conjecture of, uh, that, um, that is a conjecture that is also wide open that is related to the abundance conjecture. And uh, well, I mean, also this conjecture is wide open, but maybe we, we have a better chance of proving uh, something in this direction. So let me mention some related results. So there is the paper of Campana, Petanel, Obiso, which is titled um, Non Algebraic Hyperkähler Manifolds, I think it's the title, and they show that if um, S is Keller and Non algebraic, non projective. And then they have some assumptions on the algebraic dimension. So um, the algebraic dimension of X, um, I think it has to be at least different from zero. Um, well, okay, I mean, they, they don't have a, a complete result. Um, so let's say plus something else, then um, there exists a Lagrangian vibration x to e, which is the so-called algebraic reduction. The algebraic dimension of a com complex manifold is the uh, degree of transcendence of this field of meromorphic functions. So if you're an algebraic variety of dimension n, then the projective, then the field of meromorphic functions has transcendent, transcendence to be equal to the dimension of the algebraic variety. If you're just a complex compact manifold, and this is not the case, the algebraic dimension by a theorem of Siegel is always smaller or equal than the dimension. And if it's equal to the dimension, then you're in the case of a Moisheson variety. And, and otherwise, uh, well, you get something that's called the algebraic reduction. So that is uh, x to some base s. You call that g, such that g upper star is an isomorphism from the field of meromorphic functions on S to the field of meromorphic functions on X. And, and S is, is algebraic. So somehow um, everything that you can get out of the meromorphic functions on X is what you what you put in this variety S. And, um, so, but still, I mean, to assume that the algebraic dimension is not zero, and I think that's uh, they, they even need more. Um, 
uh, is is a heavy assumption. The claim now is for the algebraic reduction is the regular and the line of regularity. Uh, yes, as I said, there, there are some, some additional assumptions. So in the case where the algebraic dimension is just different from zero, I think that's not enough. But uh, eventually, in the case where they're able to prove the existence of Lagrangian vibrations, the Lagrangian vibration is the algebraic reduction. Birational mode. So suppose you have a section, and then you contract that section and extract into. I mean, you flop the section, for example. By this, you could destroy a Lagrangian vibration uh, from being uh, regular, just, uh, just rational. But as soon as you have a section, um, the, uh, the uh, total space has to be projected. A Lagrangian vibration of a Kähler non-projective IHSM can never have a section. In the um, rational case, just the conjecture, uh, is there a hypothesis that prevents you from like taking specifically one of an anti uh, well, uh, That's a uh, that's a good point. Um, yeah, 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 you're right. Um, uh, so, you mean, like, that so, so the, the question was um, in in the uh, rational version of the conjecture, what if you replace L by minus L, then the assumptions still hold, and the, um, the you cannot have a map because there are no sections. So, well, maybe I should say take take n uh, an, an integer. <laughs> I think you're right. So one, one has to one has to rule out this case. Well, in, in the rational, uh, in, the, in the case oh, of the rational um, uh, vibration, I don't assume. Um, yeah. sure, sure, sure. But you're right, I should say, I think the, the right assumption would not just be that Q of it is zero, but that you lie actually on the boundary of the positive cone. Right. That's, that's, that's probably the better assumption. Um, yeah. Okay, so. And there is another uh, result in the direction of existence of Lagrangian vibration. So if you have T in X, a Lagrangian uh, complex torus, or B in variety is the same, then uh, there is this F from X to B with T as a fiber. And this is a result in Rekhev, uh, myself, and Olenska in the case of uh, non-projective X. And then Wang and Weiss used that uh, to, to deal with the case of Protective X, um, and what we what this results together give you is an almost holomorphic Lagrangian vibration, and then there was another contribution by Matsushita saying that if you have an almost holomorphic vibration, then you get a holomorphic vibration. Well, it's a slightly different assumptions, but it also goes in the direction of existence of Lagrangian vibrations. Yeah, so, um, let's say L in no, you want the positive probability is better. It doesn't fit in the bilateral model, right? So, where? 
As soon as you're almost holomorphic, um, it can be extended to something um, holomorphic. I mean, you have to change the, you possibly have to change the birational model of D, but not of X. Uh, this, this tells you some of that if you have a if you have a torus, um, so if you have a rational Lagrangian fibration which is not uh, not regular, then the fibers are only birational to toroid, not toroid, so cannot be toroid. Okay. Uh, yeah. Questions. So, what would be interesting? Cases to, to consider here. I think, again, in something with more geometric assumptions, um, oh, I didn't write them down. Great. Um, what were the so definitely, um, uh, let me prove some proof conjecture under additional lattice theoretic assumptions. So that's what they do, uh, as, uh, as it was in fact, is, um, turns out to be uh, the case of Hilbert schemes of two points on a KP surface. But still, you could think of adding similar assumptions about the lattice and then trying to prove the, the conjecture. Uh, that would be interesting. And also, as I said, we, we know the conjecture in all known examples of smooth uh, holomorphic, irreducible holomorphic symplectic varieties. What about uh, singular, singular X? So the, I think, so in the case of Nikulin orbifolds, I think SYZ is not known. So EG, and cool in all reports. So, for example, so uh, it is. Um, I think it's probably not that difficult to prove for the for the quotient uh, of the Hilbert scheme. But then, if you take this partial resolution, you have one more uh, direction which you can deform, uh, and then you cannot just infer the result from from the non results on the Hilbert scheme. I think that would be an interesting case to consider. <coughs> All right. Yes, uh, so much for conjectures about existence and then some of the comparison with K3 surfaces at one last point, which was deformation. So this is something that uh, also in, in the higher dimensional case is much more difficult than in the uh, surface case. So what what do I um, what do I want to deform here? Uh, I should, and maybe I should say some words about deformations in, in general. We've seen in Sophia's talk that uh, deformations of X are controlled by the tangent sheet, in some sense. So in the complex world, EG. If H0 of the tangent sheet 
is zero, or I H S M, this is the case, right? Because H zero of the tangent sheet is H zero of the cotangent sheet. That is the same as H10, as well as the part of H1 and H1 vanishes. Therefore, um, this assumption holds for hypercalibrated varieties. But if this uh, is zero, then X has a universal deformation. So that's something we usually denote. Curly x over def x, so that's a complex space. Uh, that's a family which is flat. I would like to assume that that's also proper. A special point inside here, and this diagram is Cartesian. So that's a deformation of x, and being universal means. Um, so and universal means all other deformations they are y over some base s x are obtained by pullback. Yeah, so in such a situation you have a more than one s to that base of the universal deformation such that the curly y is a pullback from the curly x and everything is compatible with the inclusion of x. And that's what a universal deformation is and as soon as h zero, the x is zero, then there you have one. The next one is H1 of Tx. H1 of Tx is the tangent space to that x in the point zero. Good to know. So you can compute that the tangent space of um, that x at point zero has dimension equal to H11 of x, which is the dimension of h uh, uh, one of px for i h as m. All right, and then you remember there was the uh, the lifting problem in in Spears talk, and that's um, that was related to h two of of tx, so that was so called obstruction space. Fraction space, um, so compared to uh, the lifting problem. So if uh, a two of t x is equal to zero, then uh, def x is smooth. Smooth at zero. And uh, necessarily of dimension equal to the dimension of the tangent space. So that goes under the name of unobstructedness. Deformations are unobstructed, means the, um, the, the universal deformation is smooth, meaning that you, as in, um, in the first of all, we've seen that we can lift deformations from, say, order n to order n plus one, uh, and and you know, in, in the other lecture, this was more in this directions from positive characteristic to zero characteristic. Here we're just in, in 
characteristic zero, but the problem is the same. You want to look at the definition. All right. Um, unfortunately, that is not always true for uh, IHSM. It's true for K3 surfaces, but not true for uh, IHSM. So there is a theorem. Um, which is, uh, I think it's for the model of um, Todorov. Modern proof goes back to Ram and Kavamata saying that if X is IHSM, or more generally, the color we are right in the sense that the canonical bundle is trivial, then FX is smooth. The formations are unobstructed. All right. Um, so I think I won't be able to prove anything. Let me, for the rest of this lecture, at least discuss uh, deformation problems associated with a uh, Lagrange integration. But if f from x to b is the and x is an i h as m, let me call f capital F is the general <laughs> fiber, let's say fiber of little f on the beam variety. I have L, which is the pullback f upper star of something ample. Yeah, I, I need uh, L that is turn one of, of L. And then I can write down the following subspaces of the universal deformation. Consider subspaces in def x. So inside of def x, there is def x comma f. There is def x comma capital F. There is def x comma L and there is def x comma lowercase L. So the last thing is just the Hodge locus of L. And which I mean, so L is a Hodge class, it means it's of type 1 1 and uh, an integral. So um, I mean, over def x, uh, the commodity, I mean, think of it as a small disk, then the, you can canonically identify the second cohomology of two um, points in there, of x and the xt, where xt is a small deformation. So L rem certainly remains uh, integral. And the hot locus are those deformations where the class L remains um, uh, remains of type one one. So these here are deformations of X where L deforms along. Also, this is something that we've seen in the other lecture. Uh, right there, L was an was an ample line bundle, and we wanted this to get an algebraic deformation. We don't care about algebraic deformations here because we are in the complex world. Um, but the idea is the same. Here is deformations of X where 
geschäftlich von uns erlauben. Well, and then, what should that be? That's deformations of X where F deforms along. Deformations that preserve the Lagrangian federation. And we will see in the next lecture that in our setup, actually all of these spaces coincide. So you can test whether the whether the vibration deforms, that's some of the case that we're that we're interested in. When does the vibration deform? And it, it deforms as soon as the fiber deforms, it deforms as soon as the corresponding line bundle deforms. Maybe the easiest thing to check is that that uh, the class remains a class type. So, and somehow, so if you think of uh, Walter Forelli, you map all of this into the period domain, then this is a, a linear condition. <laughs> A linear condition in period coordinates, and, and this alone guarantees that we continue to have a, a vibration. And you can deduce a lot of um, properties from, from this uh, equality. Yeah, but uh, something has to be left for, for the next lecture. <laughs>